Hello and welcome back to Psychology with Mr. Snyder and today we are going to begin a new section talking about sensation, perception, and we're also going to go into vision. Your learning targets for today, there's four of them. We're going to analyze the processes and concepts that affect the stimulation of the senses. It's less complicated than that. And we're going to talk about signal detection theory. Then when we get into the eye, we're going to identify the main parts of the eye and the features of our eyes, and we'll explain how our eyes allow us to have color vision. First of all, there is so much information in the world outside of the body and the brain. That information has to have a way to get into the brain where it can be used to determine actions and responses. The way into the brain is through the sensory organs and the process of sensation, which is why we talk about this in psychology. Sensation occurs when special receptors in the sense organs are activated, allowing various forms of outside stimuli to become neural signals in the brain. This process of converting outside stimuli, such as light, into neural activity is called transduction. Let's take a closer look at these special receptors. The sensory receptors are specialized forms of neurons, the cells that make up the nervous system. And instead of receiving neurotransmitters from other cells, these receptor cells are stimulated by different kinds of energy. For example, the receptors in the eyes are triggered by light, whereas vibrations trigger the receptors in the ears. Touch receptors are triggered by pressure or temperature, and the receptors in taste and smell are activated by chemical substances. Perception is the psychological process through which we interpret our sensory stimulation. So when later in this section, when we start looking at um, trick photographs and visual representations of things and um, optical illusions, your brain will flip those things back and forth because it can see it two or three different ways. That's perception. How are you perceiving that object? Now, we have some different levels that we study when we talk about sensation. The first one is the absolute threshold, and that is the absolute weakest amount of a stimulus that can be sensed 50% of the time that the stimulation is present. So absolute thresholds differ from humans to animals and also from person to person. For example, how much salt must be added to a glass of water before the change in taste can be detected in at least half of the taste tests? And then the minimum amount of difference that can be detected between two stimuli is known as the difference threshold. For example, you might be eating pasta with five teaspoons of Parmesan cheese on top. If you wanted to make your pasta taste even cheesier, you'd have to add more cheese. But how much more? Let's say in order to make a noticeable difference to the pasta's taste half the time, you would have to add one teaspoon of cheese. That one teaspoon would be the difference threshold. Here is a chart of some various measurements of a person's absolute threshold for sensory perception. In vision, you may be able to see a candle flame viewed from a distance of 30 miles on a dark night. That is how sensitive your eyes are, and all of our sensory receptors are very sensitive. You might be able to hear the ticking of a watch from about 20 feet away in a quiet room. You could smell a drop of perfume diffused in a small house. Uh, taste and the touch one is a little weird. You could feel the wing of a fly falling on your cheek from a distance of less than half an inch. Now, sensory adaptation. We've talked about before about the, how the brain is only interested in changes in information, your reticular activating system. That's why people don't really hear the noise of the air conditioner unless it suddenly cuts off or the noise made in some classrooms unless it gets very quiet. Although they are actually hearing it, they are not paying attention to it. This is called habituation, and it's the way the brain deals with unchanging information from the environment. Another process by which constant unchanging information from the sensory receptors is ignored is a different process from habituation. The difference is that in habituation, the sensory receptors are still responding to the stimulation but the lower centers of the brain are not sending the signals from those receptors to the cortex. 
In sensory adaptation, the receptor cells themselves become less responsive to unchanging stimulus. The receptors are no longer sending signals to the brain. So without sensory adaptation, clothes would probably drive people crazy because they would be constantly aware of every piece of clothing or jewelry they have on. They would feel the seat of the chair they are sitting on constantly instead of just when they move. Bad odors like the garbage can smell would never go away. When you jump into a cold pool, it would be cold the rest of the time you're in there instead of you adapting to it and not feeling it anymore. Some stimuli do not display this kind of ad adaptation. For example, we usually do not adapt to pain. If you break your leg, you will continue to feel that your leg is broken until you do something about it. Signal detection theory is a method of distinguishing sensory stimuli that takes into account not only the stimuli strengths as the, als as the other theories do, but also variables as like the setting, your physical state, the mood, the attitudes, the settings such as a quiet room versus a loud room. It'd be much easier to hear in a quiet room. Your physical state such as if I have a cold, I won't be able to taste food as well. Your mood and your attitudes also affect how you perceive sen uh, sensations. It also considers psychological factors such as your motivations, your expectations, and your learning. So basically, you focus on what you consider important and you make active decisions about what you perceive and what you sense. Now let's talk about the eye and get into section two. The eye is covered, first of all, in the cornea, and that's the part you can touch with your finger, and that might freak some of you out, but if you have contact lenses such as myself, it's not a big deal. The cornea not only protects the eye, but is also the structure that focuses most of the light coming into the eye. The light coming into the eye from a visual image enters the interior of the eye through a hole called the pupil. The hole is in a round muscle called the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. The iris can change the size of the pupil, letting more or less light into the eye. This helps people focus the image. People try to do the same thing by squinting. Behind the iris, suspended by muscles, is another clear structure called the lens. The flexible lens finishes the focusing process begun by the cornea and can change its shape from thick to thin in a process called visual accommodation, which allows the eye to focus on objects that are close or far away, and people lose this ability as the lens hardens through aging. Once through the eye, or one, I'm sorry, once through the lens, light passes through a large open space filled with a clear jelly-like fluid called the vitreous humor. This fluid also nourishes the eye and gives it its shape. So in here, this would be the vitreous humor. And this slide here shows you the process of seeing from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. The final stop for light in the eye is the retina, which is a light sensitive area at the back of the eye. It contains photoreceptors that respond to the various light waves, and those photoreceptors are called rods and cones. And I'll get into rods and cones more in a little bit. The rods and cones are the business end of the retina. That's the part that actually receives the light and turns it into neural signals sent to the brain via the optic nerve, we also have a blind spot in our eye right where the optic nerve meets the retina, and there are no photoreceptor cells here, and I will actually show you, and you'll be able to see your blind spot with a little demonstration in class. So the two kinds of photoreceptors are called rods and cones. The rods, there's about 120 million of them in each eye, are found all over the retina except in the very center. The very center only has cones. Rods are sensitive to changes in brightness, but not to changes in wavelength. So rods only see in black and white and shades of gray. Because rods are located on the periphery of the retina, they are also responsible for our peripheral vision. Because rods work so well in low levels of light, they are also the cells that allow the eyes to adapt to low light. 
Dark adaptation occurs as the eye recovers its ability to see when going from a brightly lit state to a dark state. The light sensitive pigments that allow us to see are able to regenerate or recharge in the dark. The brighter the light was, the longer it takes the rods to adapt to the new lower levels of light. Full dark adaptation, which occurs from going from a constant light to darkness, such as like turning out your bedroom lights at night, takes about 30 minutes. As people get older, this process takes longer, causing many older persons to be able to see it, uh, less able to see at night and in darkened rooms. When going from a darkened room to one that is brightly lit, the opposite process occurs. The cones have to adapt to the increased level of light, and they accomplish this light adaptation much more quickly than the rods adapt to darkness. It takes a few seconds at most. There's about six million cones in each eye. Here you can see the process again, and this is the famous, the lens bends light and images so that we actually see them upside down on our retina but our brain is smart enough to flip this image back upside down so that it is correct. Visual acuity is how sharp or clear our vision is. And this is what the eye chart at the doctor's office measures. And it's also what they're referring to when they say 2020. 2020 is normal vision. 20 feet, the 20 is the amount of feet away from the chart. So to compare it to something, 2040 vision is half as good. A person that can read the chart from 20 feet away, as well as a normal person could read it from 40 feet away. And so 2010 is half as good. Or I'm sorry, 2010 is twice as good. Now let's talk about color. And this is the famous color wheel. It is taken from the visual light spectrum in and bent into a circle. The color wheel is made up of the colors of the spectrum bent into a circle. The complementary colors are the colors across from each other on the color wheel. And when we refer to color here, we're referring to light and not paint or pigments. When the complementary colors of light mix, they form gray in the middle but the complementary color of blue is orange, the complementary color of red is green, purple is yellow, and so on. We will get into that sooner, or very soon, because it will, uh, we're going to talk about the color theory. In humans, some cones are sensitive to blue, some are sensitive to red, and some are sensitive to gr uh, green. This is known as the trichromatic theory. And when more than one kind of cone is stimulated, we perceive other colors. And just so you know, our color vision d differs from other animals. Fish do not see color. Dogs see fewer colors than humans because they only have two types of cones. Birds have four or more cones and can see much richer colors than humans can. I always wonder what that would look like. The after image is a visual impression that remains after the original image is removed. Unfortunately, the trichromatic theory cannot account for this after image. If a person stares at the picture of the American flag for a little while, like a minute, and then looks away to a blank white wall or sheet of paper, that person will see an after image of the flag. After images occur when a visual sensation persists for a brief time, even after the original stimulus is removed. The person would also notice rather quickly that the colors of the flag in the after image are the complementary colors on the color wheel. And we'll do this in a little bit, but the after images occur because the cones of the eye become tired after staring intensely at a single color. They fire uh, more slowly and then it will not work as well and you'll see the complementary color. The size of the after image depends on the distance from which it is viewed. So if you view, there's also an American flag in your book you can look at. If you look at that and then look at a white sheet of paper, it will appear small. If you look at that and then look at a blank white wall, it will appear very large. Here are the directions. You can actually try it right now. We will get better, um, better results if we're looking at a piece of paper rather than a computer screen, but We'll try this in class. 
Go ahead and pause right now and look at it. Color blindness occurs because there are defective cones in the retina of the eye. There's three kinds of color blindness. Uh, people either have no cones or cones that are not working. That's very rare, however. And if people have red-green color blindness, either their red or their green cones are not working, and they see the world in blues, yellows, and shades of gray. If the blue cones are not working, that's less common. They see reds, greens, and shades of gray. And that's simply what colorblindness is, is it's not, the cones in the eye are not working. That's all I have for you today. I'll see you in class.